you're good to go. Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Brian Balthurst and I work with the Pulp team um, and I'm gonna be showing off uh, the Pulp Core. Uh, the 314 release has new high availability. Um, it's fully highly available from an application perspective. So I'm gonna share a little bit about the architecture and some of the components that get involved with that. Um, this is, you know, really presenting um, the work of a lot of great folks. So I'm just happy to hear and uh, show it off. Um, for those on the call who are here, um, please go ahead and ask questions um, as they come up. It, um, you don't need to wait until the end, just unmute and, and jump in. And then uh, I'm gonna give a tiny demo at the end of it, um, very short. And then uh, if you're watching this later, there's also some contact information at the bottom and the last slide that you'll see. So feel free to ask questions that way as well. Um, let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, this is zoomed in just a little bit too much. Um, uh, so this is the three, four, pulp core 314 architecture diagram. So when I say pulp core, that's um, a, a, a Python component um, and that's kind of the, the heart of pulp. Um, and so uh, it is currently, it's GA released as 314, it came out I don't know, maybe about a month ago, 315 is gonna come out in early August. Um, we release about every five weeks. And so uh, this is the architecture diagram for um, 314. Uh, the question, the prompt that I had gotten for this presentation was, how does high availability work in 314? How is it different than what was here previously? So you'll see a little bit of the other architecture diagrams to compare this against in a little bit. Um, and uh, how would a person more or less go about setting up um, a highly available system? So uh, this is architecture diagram has kind of, I'd say four pulp components and then two underlying services. Are you able to see my cursor? Yep. Okay, great. Yes. So um, thank you. Uh, so um, the pulp components are these three in the middle and I'm gonna start with those. So there are workers, cause pulp has a tasking system. A lot of the work in pulp runs longer than is appropriate for web servers. Like syncing large amounts of content, for example, can take definitely take minutes and sometimes, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, something like that. So um, we have these workers, which are part of the pulp tasking system and uh, you can have multiple workers. So that's what these boxes here represent. Uh, also, there's an API. Pulp is a web service um, foremost. And so uh, the REST API that we provide is is offered from this component. Um, this is run through Gunicorn, um, typically. And you can have multiple of these as well. Um, and then there's the Pulp Core content app. And uh, this is a separate um, se uh, separate processes and its responsibility is to serve binary data. So for example, if we're talking like collection content, which would be primarily tarballs, um, when the Galaxy, Ansible Galaxy CLI goes to install content from Pulp, it's gonna re be receiving that binary data um, from this component here. And you can have multiple of these as well. Um, you might be wondering why there's an API component and a Pulp core content component. They use different web, um, web server technologies. One it's built on Django, which is the API stuff, and the other one uses this thing called AIO HTTP server. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for why we use two technologies here, but um, that's not important right now. What is important now is that uh, we use two technologies, and so there's two, um, our API kind of needs two components in order to run. Um, each of these components need to run uh, on some things that we assume to already be there. So if you're gonna have, one of them is a clustered Postgres uh, database. Um, Pulp requires Postgres specifically. Also a clustered file system. Um, we expect, uh, you can change the location of it um, in terms of the file system mount point, but generally by default, we use slash var slash lib slash pulp. Um, and we read and write a lot of data out there that um, ends up how we share a lot of file data between um, processes. So you'll need a clustered file system and you'll need a clustered Postgres. And our assumption when we make the pulp application and the pulp installer is that um, we don't really get into configuring or setting up 
clustered file systems or clustered Postgres. Um, there's, it's a, it's a relatively complicated thing to do, especially the clustered Postgres. And um, we're not dedicated to that mission. We're dedicated to the development of pulp applications. So our installer will set you up a simple version of Postgres, um, but that's it. So uh, from a user perspective, you'll, the users will need to provide these two things um, themselves. And then we can have our services configured to run on top of them. Um, the file system is basically all the machines that you deploy these pulp services on need to have varlib pulp mounted. Um, so that can be like NFS or some, something similar, um, Samba. And then uh, cluster Postgres, this is just, um, you know, typically it's, it would be its own network machine uh, or cluster machines. Um, and this these components need to be highly available in order for pulp to be highly available. Uh, the last component up here are the web servers. So our web servers actually act primarily as just reverse proxies. And the web servers only um, per, you know, connect in between. You can see these two arrows. They only connect in between the API and the pulp core content. Um, user connections, which flow through these reverse proxies, um, never connect directly to workers. Um, they only deal with you know, the APIs and then ultimately the APIs um, kick off tasks with the workers. So you can have multiple web servers, and this is how you can keep this component highly available. Uh, you can have, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do this, and we're not really prescriptive about which one. Um, some folks like to use load balancers like HAProxy. Others like to use DNS load balancing, um, but uh, which you put, you could put a load balancer kind of in the middle here, um, in between, say, the web servers and the cluster of pulp core API services um, processes. Similarly, in front of the pulp core content processes, um, but uh, you could also, you know, have your web server configs name all of these um, independently, and I'll show you an example of that config. Um, that's a little bit tricky to manage because if you do have an availability degradation and you need to take out some set of your web servers, you have to effectively update your web server configs. So that's really not ideal. Um, another option is to use uh, DNS load balancing. Um, and that's a pretty good option as well. Um, but overall, no matter what you choose, you need to make sure that the services that you're offering connections to are available and Pulp has a status API, which can um, be used for things like HA proxy or um, DNS load balancing, or even some other mechanism to change your web server configs to know, hey, which of these web server, which of these services online? And I'll show you the status API in a little bit. Um, you can also similarly, just to call it out in front of these web servers, uh, you probably are gonna want either an HA proxy or a DNS load balancing here. And um, that's what kind of um, fans out the delivery of inbound user connections and uh, to the various web servers, which in turn reverse proxy them to the various backend services, application processes. Um, and uh, that's a lot of information. So please jump in with any questions uh, that you have. Um, and what I want to do is, so this is a logical diagram. Um, this is shows like, hey, what are all the logical pieces? Uh, now, this is a physical diagram. So uh, this is a three host diagram. And you can organize the processes across any number of hosts. You know, you probably want these hosts in different availability zones. Um, because, you know, if, if an availability zone loses power, you don't want to put all your stuff in that one availability zone because then you're not highly available. But um, these, this is a three-host example, and what I've done, you know, people can deploy this in different ways. But what I've kind of pitched here is have each host contain a web server, the Pulp Core API, the Pulp Core Content, and the Pulp Core Worker, and that way they're all similar, they're all the same and homogeneous. So you can just make more of them, and I think that's a pretty good way to deploy it. Um, but that's a subjective choice. You can choose it differently. 
Um, you could have dedicated machines just for web servers, et cetera. Um, in this example, your web server can literally always be configured to talk to Pulpcore API and Pulpcore content via localhost. So that's also really convenient because your web server config never needs to change. Um, and uh, so hopefully it's clear what I'm trying to convey in this diagram, which is that we have three machines, host one, two, and three, and we have um, these four services uh, on each machine. And you can just deploy more of them um, or fewer of them, et cetera. And the pulp application should just keep working. The only thing that you really have to load balance in this example is the inbound connections to connect to this web server one, two, and three on host one, two, and three. Uh, let's look at some configs and I'll show this when I do my little demo um, as well, like on the actual config. But uh, in the web server config, there's this pulp-content um, server and you can list one or more entries here. This is my host one, two, and three example. And um, Pulp API host one, two, and three. In my physical diagram here, I, uh, you know, I was explaining that you would have them always connect to localhost. So in that case, you know, you wouldn't use this snippet. You would use just localhost. Probably hear my son in the background. Um, hold on a second. Um, so then, uh, regardless, this is how the web servers know how to reach these various, um, these various components, pulp content is the one web service and then pulp API is the other one. Um, you can configure these variables using the installer and I'm not going to really get into the mechanics of the installer today, but, um, you can configure, you can basically have a pulp installation set these kinds of settings using our installer. And there are some variables here that can do that. And just to show, um, well, I'm sharing this screen, so it's not going to easily show it without me switching. But this link will take you to the pulp installer docs, which talk about how to set these variables. Uh, so what about capacity? Um, We'll talk about failure scenarios here in a little bit because it's really about high availability. But I just want to point out that um, as you increase your availability with Pulp, you also increase your capacity. Um, it, the more Pulp core workers you have, the more tasking throughput you have. So that's tasks per second, operations per second, like syncs, publishes, stuff like that. Um, the more Pulp core API uh, processes you have, the more API requests you can serve um, concurrently. The more Pulp core content, services you have, the more content, binary content you can serve to clients. Um, so as we increase availability with Pulp, we also increase capacity. And that's not true for all web services, but it is here. Uh, so some of the failure scenarios, um, we uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that you only want to route API and content requests to live services. Um, and so uh, you know, HAProxy is really good at that because HAProxy can monitor the backend web services that it's routing requests to and, um, you know, uh, only route requests to them when they're responsive. And so that's a great thing to use. Um, or you can use the status API, which is the second point here, to um, know what is available. Um, all these components kind of have uh, regular every few second heartbeat check-ins. And that's what drives the status API. And so it's going to continue to give you a real time look at all of the whole pulp installation, even across you know multiple machines, because that one status API is monitoring all processes. Um, the workers, so with the pulp core 314 tasking system, and it's a new tasking system with pulp core 314. Um, so this is one of the main things that we couldn't do with earlier versions. Um, the workers auto organize. And so you don't have to configure them. You literally just start them and they're auto discovered. And when they die or if they die unexpectedly, they're auto taken out of service. And so the workers kind of just handle themselves. Um, in the worst case, you'll get one canceled task. Um, where's Redis in Pulp Core 314? Um, Pulp uh, uses Redis and has used Redis in earlier versions. Um, I need it, but it's not an architecture diagram. So like, where is it, Brian? Um, well, it's still here. Um, 
but it's only used for in pulp core 314 for speeding up content serving for caching per, with with um, kind of an application level cache um, it's optional and pulp can be configured not to use it but i also want to point out that if you do want to use redis uh, you can configure redis in a clustered mode and we expect um, the caching features to work with that as well so um, it's not uh, it's optional so it's not really part of the high availability story, but if you want want it, go ahead and configure it in a clustered mode. Um, and what you'd get is, a this is a more accurate architecture diagram. It's the same one as before, only now there's Redis down here, clustered or not. And um, pulp core content uh, talks to it. And there should be more arrows actually, other stuff does talk to it as well, that's not accurate. Um, but it's kind of neither here nor there because either you'll cluster it and that's part of your HA or you won't and you won't worry about it and you'll configure pulp not to use Redis. So one of the things I want to cover here is what, how is this different than before? I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, but I do just want to share a couple of basic pieces of information. Um, one of the main changes is earlier, you know, in 3.13 and earlier, we had this component called resource manager. And um, it was kind of the task coordinator. And you could start multiple of these. I'm only showing one here, but you could start multiple of them. Um, but the issue, the real issue is that the technology that was used for our resource manager um, was not made by us, um, but it would not work with a clustered Redis. And so because the resource manager is a absolutely required component to work correctly for pulp to work correctly and because it relied on a service that could not be clustered pulp never could support high availability in 313 and earlier so we don't have the resource manager anymore we moved off of this technology altogether um, this is part of what is called the queue list tasking system um, this is the tasking system that comes with 314 and uh, this tasking system is enabled by default the previous tasking system is still here. You could actually configure Pulp to use it. We want to keep it around for a few releases just so that everyone is comfortable moving to the new one. But um, you don't have to do anything to enable it. Just use Pulp Core 314 and you won't uh, need a resource manager. And uh, you'll end up with an architecture diagram. You'll just be using this one. This is the 314 kind of by default. Um, the other really great uh, the other main limitation I do want to call out about 3.13 is, is the performance throughput of tasking. Um, there's a rate, uh, all tasks had to flow through the resource manager. And so there's a rate limit, no matter how many workers you started up here, um, the resource manager would uh, only allow you to process so many per tasks per second. It was pretty low, like um, maybe two tasks per second, which is a very low number. Um, typically, pulp tasks are long running, so that wasn't maybe a huge deal, but in some cases, um, some folks have, say, 1600, like a burst of like 1,600 tasks, and it was kind of a big deal for them. Um, Matias, I'm going to show off one of your slides. Uh, this is from a blog post that talks a lot about the new tasking system and its performance. And um, the thing I really want to draw your attention to is this bottom section here, which talks about the service time which you can think of as the throughput of tasks. This x-axis are the number of workers. And the green x's are the new version, uh, 314 plus. And the pluses here in purple are 313 and earlier. And so you can see that no matter how many workers you start, at least up to 32, the throughput doesn't really change. Um, and that's, that's a big problem. Um, but what you can see is that with the new tasking system, when you start more workers, you get a lot more tasking throughput. And this is a logarithmic scale. So this is um, this being linear is actually um, roughly an exponential growth along with an exponential growth in worker count. So enough about that. We have not much time left, but that's okay because I have a very short demo. Um, are there any questions while I switch my screen around here? So if we we're used to have a node uh, with a pulp core API, pulp core content, like all the service in one, as you just showed mm -hmm. in your demo. Yep. Basically to scale and be uh, HA, you just need to get a new node, like one, two, yep, three. It's, 
It's the exact yeah. same thing, just you deploy more nodes. There is no notion yeah. of core room. I, I haven't heard the notion of core room in your presentation. That means that we don't care if it is an odd or even number of nodes. There is no master election. There is nothing. Yep, exactly. Well, Exactly. There's no master election. And internally at the application layer, a lot of this stuff runs on just distributed algorithms. And um, they don't, the way that those algorithms work in practice don't need the leader election of any kind. So, from an uh, orchestration uh, automation perspective, this is, there is no change to do. If, you, if one were to already do all in one, everything comes from the infrastructure. You just need to have the proper infrastructure on the back, so the cluster Postgres and the cluster file system. For the rest, you can scale to as many nodes all in one you want. Is that correct? Exactly. OK. That's correct. Yep, it, yep. that's exactly right. Um, so what I, what I want to show here is um, we have this tool that generates a whole bunch of tasks. I'm going to generate 100 tasks um, here. and. Uh, um, First, I'm going to show the status of things. First, I'm going to start poll. That helps. Um, so this is a look at the status API. It's still it's still starting, so it's not fully done yet. Yeah. So um, you can see your online content apps. Um, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight eight content apps running here. Um, and then there are, this is the API itself. So we don't actually report on the API. You have at least one running. This is something we could do. We do not report on them right now. You're talking to the API right now. So you know you have at least one thing running. Um, that's probably something we should improve. Um, also online workers, these are the workers. So we have only two running. So this is one and this is two. Um, and this is the kind of information that you would want to use to uh, configure your your you know your routing and things like that. But again, if you're you don't really need to do much of that as long as you put all of your services in one box and just have your web server talk to localhost. Um, so that's the status API. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just run a bunch of um, tasks here. Uh, and this is using I'm kind of showing this off with the pulp command, which is the pulp CLI. Um, so here you can see um, uh, you can see that there's um, a lot of tasks that are in the waiting the waiting state. So these are uncompleted. Um, look at the completed tasks. It's kind of churning through those as well. I don't have a great way of listing these. I was using our web interface, but I realize now because I'm screen sharing, that's not going to be so easy. Um, but the idea here is that um, with two workers, it'll turn through 100 tasks in about 45 or 50 seconds. Uh, these tasks are very short. This is kind of a benchmarking tool. And uh, what I'm going to do is, because we are at the end of our time, um, I'm going to just uh, start um, a few more workers. And um, these kind of worker, these workers just, uh, this work on pulp command I'm running just um, activates the virtual env that pulp is installed in. So that's a common thing that you'll do. Um, so I can just start more and more workers, and they already start working on tasks kind of automatically. So and then I can stop them. OK, I just exited this one. Oh, look, it stopped. Um, and. If I go, this one's working on tasks. Um, if I go and look at the pulp status, you can see that it's showing that there's, I left one additional worker working. So um, that's the long and short of my demo. Um, just want to kind of demonstrate how the tasking system works. And then uh, just to wrap this up, I'm going to show one last slide, which is the um, kind of how to contact us slide. Um, Here's a look at some additional resources. So um, you can go to paulproject.org help, and this has links to kind of all of our channels, our mailing list, user support, developer discussion, um, and the matrix channels to get a hold of developers. Uh, there's also this um, 
there's a whole presentation on our tasking system that talks in more depth about how the algorithm works and stuff like that. Um, that Matthias uh, is the um, presenter there. So you can check that out if you're interested in how the 314 tasking system works. And also here are general docs and here are the installer docs. And then the last thing is, um, this is my contact information if you have any questions um, or feedback for me on this presentation. And I just wanna thank the folks who organized this. I just want to say thanks for putting this together. Um, uh, since I'm going to be working on the the pulp operator work, um, I um, or kind of working on maintaining the pulp operator, I went through 